So we've talked a lot about the Bernoulli equation and looked at several different ways to use it. Now let's go to a full-fledged conservation of energy. So we're going to start with the Bernoulli equation and I've added a few things to it. We now have HP, which is the pump head. This allows us to deal with pumps and turbines. We also now have HL, which is our head loss term, and this allows us to deal with uh, losses in energy. There's also alphas in there, but I'm going to get to that later. Um, so let's compare Bernoulli versus conservation of energy. Um, first of all, we have, in with the Bernoulli equation, we needed to assume inviscid flow and no energy losses. Now we can deal with that. We have this head loss term. But that doesn't really mean we're off the hook. Now we can handle head losses, but now we have to evaluate it. We've got a new unknown in our equation, which we have to deal with. Um, pumps and turbines we couldn't handle with Bernoulli. Now we can. We have this pump head turn, and we'll talk about how to evaluate that. This is a subtle point. Bernoulli we had to solve along a streamline, and we dealt with points. With conservation of energy, we're really supposed to use a control volume approach where we talk about fluxes crossing a control surface. Uh, we still have to maintain the incompressible assumption and we still have to maintain the steady flow assumption. Okay, let's look first at that pump head term. Um, the power consumed by a pump can be determined by the flow rate times gamma times the pump head divided by the efficiency of the pump. Um, if we flip this around so we can insert it into the energy equation, the pump head is equivalent to this. Um, notice for turbines we have to make a couple changes. Um, first of all, turbines would be negative in the equation because they're, they're drawing energy out of the system. And also the efficiency is on the bottom instead of the top of the equation. And this seems kind of strange at first, but if you think it through, I think it makes a lot of sense. For pumps, let's say we have a 100 horsepower pump that's 70% efficient. That means that it's going to deliver only 70 horsepower to the water, right? Because 30% gets lost. For turbines, let's flip this around and say we have a turbine that generates 100 horsepower and is 70% efficient. Well, if it's only 70% efficient, then it must be pulling more than 100 horsepower out of the water, and then 30% is lost, right? So it's actually taking 143 horsepower out of the water. So that's why the efficiency term needs to go on the bottom for turbines. Okay, let's do an example with this. We have flow through a pipe into a pump and then out a smaller pipe that, that then jets into the atmosphere. It passes through a filter and um, the pressure is measured upstream of the filter as negative 20 kilopascals. We've got information on the pump and the areas of the cross-sectional areas of the pipes before and after the pump. So with a given flow rate, the question is find the head loss in the filter. Okay, first we're going to start with the energy equation, and I wrote two, um, picked two points there, upstream and downstream. For these two points, the elevations are the same, so they drop out of the equation. Um, the pressure in the free jet is obviously equal to zero, and that's all. I, that's the only simplifications I can make. We're given the flow rate and the cross-sectional area. So we can calculate the velocities at the, in, at the uh, water flowing into the control volume and the water exiting the control volume. So that's just Q over A, and we can do that calculation. And now the pump head, which goes into the energy equation, we've got everything we need to solve that. We've got the power, the efficiency, the gamma for water, and the flow rate. So we have 40.8 meters of energy going into the system or 40.8 head from the, delivered by the pump. Now we've got everything that goes into the equation and we can solve for our head loss of 7.69 meters. Okay, the, 
next major thing to really talk about is head loss, but I'm going to put that off to the next lecture because we're going to spend a fair amount of time talking about head loss. It's fairly complex. Um, there's one more thing I need to talk about, though. I need to get to those alphas. If we have flow down a pipe, and I describe the velocity coming out of the pipe as 5 feet per second, what velocity am I really talking about there? Um, we've done this over and over again already without really thinking what velocity we're talking about. Do I, am, do I mean that every little block of fluid that's coming out of that pipe is traveling at 5 feet per second in that direction? And the more you think about it, you realize that that, that can't be true, right? There's turbulence and the water's spinning around. Um, there's probably velocity directions all over the place in different spots at the pi in the pipe at any one moment. And further from chapter one, we know that there's this no-slip boundary condition, right? We know at the very least that the water that's along the edge of the pipe isn't moving at all. So when we talk about velocities, we're, it's implied that we're talking about an average velocity in most cases. And the mathematics assumes a uniform velocity distribution, that all the all the water is moving at the same that same average velocity and we know that's not true either in fact the distribution may be parabolic or something else which we'll we'll talk about later on um, this parabolic distribution is common with laminar flows and you can see it satisfies the no slip boundary condition it starts at zero at the pipe walls and is a maximum velocity towards the center so these alphas go into the energy equation and they, they're they used to adjust and correct for these non-uniform distributions, which, which is really what's happening. The alpha is called a kinetic energy coefficient and it can be calculated with that formula there, which is actually quite complicated. It's got several vectors and a dot product in it and an integral. If the velocity vector and the unit normal vector of the surface are parallel, meaning if we've drawn a control volume so that the flows are perpendicular to the surface and if the fluid is incompressible, if we can make those two assumptions, and those are easy assumptions to make, this then reduces to something a lot more manageable, where alpha is simply the integral over the, the control surface of the local velocity cubed divided by the average velocity cubed and the surface area. Um, if you perform this calculation, what you'll find is for turbulent flow, the alpha is pretty close to 1. So for most cases we're dealing with turbulent flow, we will just ignore the alpha because it's probably pretty close to 1 anyway. Um, but if you're given alpha in a problem, now you know what to do with it. It goes into that um, velocity term. For laminar flow, alpha is exactly equal to 2 actually, so this makes quite a bit of difference for laminar flow conditions, and we'll talk about laminar and turbulent uh, later on. Okay, so we're dealing with implied average velocities. I also want to point out that if you calculate velocity from Q over A, that's absolutely an average velocity is what you're calculating. But what if you actually know the velocity distribution and you want to calculate the average velocity? You can do that with this equation, which is similar to the alpha equation. We're going to do the same simplification, and then it reduces to the average velocity is the integral over the control surface of the local velocity divided by A. Okay, let's do an example using this. For laminar flow, we get a parabolic flow distribution. It's zero at the pipe walls and maximum right in the center line of the pipe. And this is described by this relationship where the local velocity, little v, is equal to the center line velocity um, times 1 minus little r over big R squared, where little r is um, little r is the distance from the center of the pipe to the local velocity you're talking about, and big R is the actual radius of the pipe. Okay, so to integrate that, we start with our equation. We're going to integrate in, in the cylindrical coordinate system. We have two directions. We have the radial direction from the center outwards and then an angular direction. 
if you go back to your calculus textbook, you'll remember that if when you convert from a Cartesian coordinate system to a cylindrical coordinate system, you have to add an extra r in the equation. So we're going to do that. And so we're going to switch to the cylindrical coordinate system. We're going to insert our equation for our local velocity. And instead of cross-sectional area, we're going to put in pi r squared for that. So now we've got our complete equation. And it's the rest is a matter of calculus and integrating. We're going to distribute the vc and the r through the equation. Um, if I remember my calculus correctly, we have to integrate the interintegral first, work in, inward and then work outward from the inside outward. So um, we're going to integrate little r there. The integral of little r is just r squared over 2. The integral of little r cubed is r to the fourth over 4. Now we can add our limits of integration. The zero basically just drops out. We get big R squared and big R to the fourth. Um, now we can integrate in terms of theta. There are no thetas in the equation, so the integral of theta is just theta. And we apply our boundary conditions, and we're left with 2 pi in the numerator. OK, so we get this big, long equation that uh, pretty much everything just kind of cancels out. <laughs> And we do all that work, and what we're left with is V equals VC minus VC over 2, or the average velocity for laminar flow in a pipe is half the center line velocity. And this is, this is actually true for all laminar flow conditions.